Thank you very much, uh, Lindis. Uh, could uh, now all the four of you, Lindis, Fria, Jon Olav, Charlie, please come forward so that the audience can ask you some questions or come with some comments. Are there somebody? Are there somebody who would like to ask some questions? Here there is one. Truls, can you take them? Then here, there. Yes, I can start. Johan Holst, I'm working at the National Institute of Public Health. I'm an expert on meningitis vaccine, so this is definitely not my topic. But I must say that I'm very pleased to hear the presentation of uh, Professor Arnsen. He's one of the visionaries in the vaccine field and have done things in a different way in, for many years. However, I think it's fair to say that this is a step on the way of handling situations like Ebola. Certainly, even if you have a super plant, producing much, much better than all expression systems to purify antibodies, even though you do very nice dosing, this is for the sophisticated treatment for the few. So my question is actually two. What do you know about the mutation rate of the target sites of the three uh, sites of the modern clones. Obviously, it seems to be quite stable, so you can go back to vaccines. So when are you going turning back to vaccines, edible vaccines that actually can be used in settings like this? It will never be a, a intravenous immunoglobulin. Thank you for the question, Charlie. Uh, let me start with a question about uh, uh, mutation. As you know, there's five strains identified of, of uh, Ebola with different uh, uh, degrees of lethality. I believe the Zaire, which is now circulating in the current epidemic, is probably the worst in causing 60% or more uh, fatalities. Uh, the, unfortunately, like everything else with Ebola, there has been such limited work on basic virology that uh, there really has been no tracking of uh, mutation rate. That said, the reason that the ZMAP has three antibodies is to hit three separate domains in the surface protein of the Ebola so that if you get a mutation in one, it is anticipated that the other two antibodies hitting the other two sites would still provide protection. Uh, but again, I'd emphasize, our thoughts were that this would not get into humans for another 18 months to two years, and we had time to do things like collect different strains of uh, Ebola, check the antibodies, all this. And uh, we're, we're now in this quandary that I mentioned of, is it justified, is it ethical to, to take what limited material we have and do more studies, or should it really go directly into... Uh, in, into treatment. I'm, you had another phase of that question and my brain has already lost it. Could you repeat your question? When are you going back to um, actually pursuing vaccines because that is oh. more a, sol a viable solution. Yeah, yeah. And, but I, before you answer that, I can say that please don't only stick to uh, placebo controlled trials. Actually, it's very, very good tools to use case controls in a situation like this if you really manage to handle the, the different cases. Right, right. Um, uh, uh, vaccines. But first, the one study, I think, research study that needs to be done, could be done quite fast with monkeys, is a dosage response curve. Because we've been giving these people 10 or even greater than 10 grams per patient in three doses. That was just based upon a very preliminary monkey experiment that used that much, and no one's checked it. Maybe it takes one gram or two grams or, or whatever. And we, we need to do that because it, it makes a huge difference in manufacturing. As to vaccines, uh, yeah, the, the urgency is in vaccines. Right now, the US government, in its wisdom, has chosen to focus on an adenovirus-based uh, uh, vaccine program. I am hoping that they broaden this. The Canadians have a vaccine. 
Our group had developed a vaccine as well. It, unfortunately, ours took four doses, and so we're down lower on the priority list. We're desperately trying to get money right now to make some improvements that we think are possible to uh, uh, make a vaccine that's more effective. When we begin this project with the military, uh, before we even contemplated an epidemic, we really said Ebola is a lethal disease and there's an analog, it's rabies. Rabies moves relatively slowly initially, but it ultimately is lethal. But we have a plan for it. We have antibodies, which we stockpile, serum-derived antibodies. We stockpile in emergency rooms in the developed world, and we have a vaccine for it. We need the equivalent for Ebola, so you've got the two sides of the uh, uh, quick-acting active and the slower-acting but uh, 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 definite uh, uh, inducible uh, uh, vaccine. A question over there? Well, um, why cannot the patients themselves make enough antibodies, and why do they not, uh, the T lymphocytes, not kill the virally infected cells? And there has been a report that in patients who die from Ebola disease, there is a massive loss of lymphocytes by apoptosis. And, uh, well, apoptosis, that's a well-known process. The, the, the signal pathway of apoptosis have been well studied. And uh, it means it is possible to intervene with the signal pathways in order to protect the lymphocytes before they die. And uh, this can be done with um, cheap substances. So uh, w what I think one should try in order to get rapid methods of treatment, one should try new drugs, not stop that. But also, I think it's a vital importance to do everything possible to uh, protect the lymphocytes of the patients to, from dying from apoptosis. And this treatment should start as soon as possible after the disease has been diagnosed. Uh, Jon Olav, I'm looking at you to comment on this about uh, apoptosis on the erythrocytes. Or was it erythrocytes who went into apoptosis? Or leukocytes? Lymphocytes. We cannot hear you. You, you have to speak up. It's, uh, apparently it's about the T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes that die. Mm. The protection of the T and B lymphocytes. I, I guess my basic immunology training has uh, gone through apoptosis, uh, to be honest. <laughs> uh, so it would be like asking yeah. a lawyer to, to treat a medical case. Uh, I'm sorry about that. And I guess the challenge in this debate is that in a way we have uh, four different debates. We have a debate on the um, kind of biology level, we have a debate on the emergency level, on the public health level, and on the innovation system level. Uh, so it's hard to kind of follow all of that. And I also think that now people are thinking uh, about uh, using other kind of medicine yeah. to actually stimulate the immune system in general also. And I maybe I can make one comment, and that is, of course, there's also now attempts to try to use uh, kind of antibodies from uh, those who have survived. So actually purify plasma from those who have survived and uh, use that as treatment for uh, other uh, patients. Uh, and that is uh, potentially a viable, at least an option in the intermediate term. Please. My name is Jeanette Magnus. I work at the University of Oslo. Uh, thank you very much to all four of you and particularly to Charlie for uh, this interesting presentation. And of course, being a researcher, we always get fascinated with the ins and outs of uh, research and development. And then when Lindis comes and gives her perspective, we are back to what's really, really important. And that is that currently people are dying. So um, we will have to do all the other things that was mentioned and also what Charlie said. But Lindis, what can we do? Here we are, a ton of people coming out tonight. 
and uh, what should we do? The question is for you, Lindis. <laughs> Um, well, it's, um, I'm not really particularly, I don't know in detail what uh, the medical and uh, research capacities are in Norway in this respect, but uh, I know that every, everybody who can and know and have influence on any level <laughs> needs to, to use that influence uh, and, or, or knowledge to, to push this forward and fast. Uh, if we're talking about months, it's already the numbers are, will be huge. If we're talking years, uh, it will spread uh, throughout the, the continent um, and further. Uh, and for some reason that seems to be, we're still in denial. <laughs> it, it seems like in, in the world that no, it, it's still a problem over there. And it is a problem over there. We need to go over there and solve it where it is. But we also need really to step up. And it, it, it's, it's, it's such an emergency and such an urgency, and which is contradictory to, to what you've been saying and as others have said that that's, it's a slow process to, to develop these things. So I don't, need, I don't know how you speed up that process, but that needs to be done. And then you need to take into consideration the cost of, uh, of these vaccines and medicines when it comes how to administer them in, in these kind of settings. I'm not saying it's easy. It's really, really complicated. I just know that it will be even more complicated to solve this problem if you don't do that. I would like to follow up on Jon Ole of Rettingen. The Directorate of Health um, have now asked for more health workers to join to work in Africa. And how do then the health authorities want to secure, for instance, treatment of these health workers if they get to the disease in Africa? Uh, I can answer that, and then I would like to mm -hmm. offer one comment. Yes. Um, I think the issue is that, of course, you need to rely on protection. That's the first, and prevention, and uh, Lindis was demonstrating that. Um, and then... Uh, and of course, there's no, no protection that can give zero risk. Uh, but given that protections are used in the right way, there, there should be very little risk. So I think that's the starting point. Then this is an emergency, and we need to kind of tackle those emergency situations when they arise. And unfortunately, there has been one, uh, as you know, case uh, now here in Oslo. Um, yeah. And uh, I think that's the sad story of also helping, and that's the risks that are on the ground. And I think we just need to face those realities, and not all of them we need to plan too much ahead of, because then we would not act. And I guess that's the segue to my comment, because maybe we painted a bleak picture in a way, and I decided to do that in the sense that we have not acted either in the short time scale regarding the emergency situation or in the long time scale regarding research and development. But having said that, we also know that Ebola epidemics are normally self-contained, uh, as has been mentioned. They're normally maybe a couple of hundred cases, and then the local communities with support are able to, to, to help it, this out. And the reason is that there is a kind of more, more or less a barrier or a, a, a tipping point uh, sort of issue, because the real issue is really to uh, diminish spread. Um, and that's the concept of how many uh, kind of new cases does a case infect. And if we can get that number below one, the epidemic will die out. That's the so-called basic reproductive number. We know now that normally the basic reproductive of Ebola is around one, and actually in many settings below one in, on average. What we see in West Africa now is between 1.5 and 2. If it's on two, we know that there will be an exponential growth, and that's what we've seen. But this also illustrates that combination of public health me measures, treatment, potential, some technologies that can take us at least halfway down the road, all these combined measures, even if we have no magic bullet, they would be able to get us through that tipping point so that we can change the situation and get into a situation where we will start getting fewer numbers. So I think that's the, what we need to... Uh, Kind of by combining technologies, combining public health measures, combining clinical measures, we would be able to handle this situation. But we need all efforts on the ground and all efforts to actually push forward the clinical trials, make decision making faster in governments, like Charlie was mentioning, that that rarely happens. It can happen. 
It happens when the emergency are seen. And I think we are about to see that situation now. Thank you, Jan. Yeah, let me just add slightly to that. And, and I, that's really a wonderful question. What can we do? Uh, the fact that all these people are here tonight to hear about it is an indication that there is very sincere interest. It, for me, it's just this afternoon, it's been a strange afternoon because for the first time this Nova show was in the US. It's the equivalent of the BBC Horizon and we get these later in the US, but it was on last night. I had a phone call and two emails this afternoon from people who just said, what can we do to help? One was a TV producer in Chicago. He said, can I do something in a fundraiser to try to help? One was a tobacco farmer. He said, you know, I'll, I'll make all my facilities available if I could be helpful to you. But it, it's just an indication this, this Ebola epidemic, I think, has stirred the conscience uh, very, very broadly. And ultimately, I think our politicians do feel that. And, and uh, maybe they will get the same urgency that I expect everyone else in here feels. Thank you. I'm Arne Holst Jensen from the Norwegian Biotechnology Advisory Board and also a scientist at the Norwegian Veterinary Institute. I have a few questions, but first of all, I might just say that I think this presentation today highlights why we need more biotech research and development, not only in Norway, but I think all over the world. And this is in particular uh, a challenge given the funding systems that we have today where I think biotechnology is not given so much priority. <clears throat> uh, first, a question to Charlie uh, regarding the intellectual property rights of the technology that you have been working on. And you, you mentioned this is a collaboration between different uh, partners. Uh, would you say that all this technology is freely available so that people could eventually exploit this technology to develop new uh, let's say, vaccines or new antibodies for other neglected diseases? That's my first question. Um, also, uh, I would like to ask you about uh, production facilities, whether production facilities could be put closer to the field than the ones that you have described today. Um, then on the uh, neglected diseases as such, I guess that if we are successful in getting more funding for this kind of development so that they will no longer be neglected, then there will also maybe be a need for coordination so that we would not see people working on exactly the same disease and other diseases remaining neglected. Um, on the vaccines and vaccine development, uh, I was wondering, would you expect any would you expect any impact uh, from the microbiota? Because you're talking about edible vaccines. So the microbiology in the gut, would you perhaps uh, imagine that it could have any impact on the effect of the vaccines? Or you think this is something that doesn't need to be uh, explored very much? Uh, yeah, I think that's... Uh, yeah, sorry, last one. <laughs> uh, plants, you use tobacco. For edible vaccines, would you say that other plants perhaps would be a better idea? Which ones and why? Uh, I'll try to work backwards. Uh, for the time being, tobacco is not very good for edible, but it's very good for extraction. Working backwards uh, about uh, uh, the microbiome. It would take me 30 minutes to respond, so I won't respond. <laughs> I was afraid of that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it, let me try to go back to the first one. I had to, number one was patent, patents, I believe. Uh, first of all, I believe in patenting. It, it's uh, essential to attract the private sector, and ultimately we need the capital of uh, investment to the private sector, be it the Serum Institute of India or the, uh, uh, the, the vaccine industry in South Korea or wherever it is around the world. We need to attract investment, and that comes with patenting. In the case of the patents that are relevant for Ebola, it has not been discussed in detail thus far. There's about four separate areas of patents, but everyone I've talked to who is involved in this is very willing to put those into a humanitarian use uh, uh, agreement 
so that anything related to Ebola is essentially license free, no cost uh, going into it. And it, it may sound very altruistic, but it's just in part uh, a simple fact. No one's got the money to buy this. So why, why would you ever try to put up a patent barrier or anything else? It will be governments buying it, governments distributing it, uh, a consortium, WHO, et cetera. And it's far more efficient in my view and I think the people involved to use this as a model of what should be done, this is not the occasion to try to make profit. Now is the opportunity to advance the core technology and the whole idea of uh, working on neglected diseases. Now I have lost, there's something about vaccines was the second one and I, I, I can only deal with two or three things <laughs> at a time. Yeah, probably we should like another one to give a try. Mm -hmm. My name is Usman Mushtaq, I'm a medical student from University of Oslo. Um, just a quick question in relation to what uh, Lindis touched upon and also what Yunarna Rettingen just recently spoke about. And in terms of, um, so what we are hearing uh, earlier today, we, we heard the World Bank chief said that the world leaders have failed miserably to respond to the Ebola crisis because we lacked funding for uh, funding um, health care healthcare systems and, and health systems uh, in emergency response to fight Ebola. And we didn't hear so much about the research, to, uh, the research for funding the medicine to fight Ebola. So the question is, um, given the current crisis, uh, would it be enough to build up health systems and, and invest in health systems and would that curb the epidemics? Or at simultaneously, would it, would, would it now be the time to invest in Ebola medicine as well? Or should the funding go to uh, building um, the health systems? Thank you. Well, there's no simple answer, and I think maybe the two of us can talk about that. Uh, you can't implement a therapeutic plan in uh, West Africa unless you've got the infrastructure, the doctors, uh, everything else. This particular drug, ZMAP, works best if you get it early in the infection cycle. And I think the people, the two people where it failed to help them were later in the infection cycle, and in one case, quite elderly. Uh, we need diagnostic tests. It was wonderful to hear that uh, you are getting some diagnostic facilities close to your uh, tent areas so that Excuse me, you have to use the microphone because... Uh, so that you can... You, you need the diagnostic so you can detect who had this, has a disease early. I, 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 you, you must talk about it. But there has to be a triage sense that this person is too far gone. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you try to give them the best care, palliative care that you can. Others are early in the disease. They deserve the therapy. Uh, others... Uh, yeah. I mean, you must know a lot more about this than I do. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> but I, I am sure that we need both, uh, definitely. Uh, we need to scale up the healthcare system. We already needed to do that before this Ebola crisis. Um, there, there were 60 doctors in Liberia before this crisis. Now 10% of them are no longer among us. So, uh, and the, the whole healthcare system is in crumbles. So you, people die in childbirth and of malaria maybe even more than, or not maybe, more than of Ebola. So yes, we need that, and we need to, to work on the, on the, the vaccination and the, and the drug as well at the same time. And I think that we haven't had that, that much focus on that, uh, and, and it needs to be understood. And I, I don't think we should count on the fact that, yes, in other, this, other epidemics of Ebola, it has um, burned out itself. Uh, I don't think with the case of Monrovia, that that is possible, actually. And I think the only way to not to, to, go, to stop the transmission, definitely in a place like Monrovia, is a vaccine. And, and uh, with regard, you, you specifically said WHO, and uh, they have failed. So what's the solution? We want more money. Uh, that's a standard government uh, policy. It, if we did a bad job, we want more money. Uh, and it's not because I'm sitting next to this lady here. I've been reading in the U.S. Uh, newspapers recently, the only organization that has been responsible has been Doctors Without Borders because they have moved in, brought people in. They don't talk about it. They do something. 
I, I fear in our case in the government, uh, our president has promised now 30,000 troops are going to West Africa to build facilities, et cetera. I mean, that was announced, boom, we're going. Nothing has happened. And, and government just, we don't work that way, you know? We got committees studying it and there'll be groups. We'll be studying it in three years, for God's sakes. It's, uh, I commend you guys, because you, you really seem to do things. Then we have a last question. Uh, my name is Rune Kjek and I come from the Norwegian Medicine Agency. So thank you first for a brilliant talk. Brilliant talk. Uh, so my question to you is, if you can, given that you can produce enough of, of setmap, how would you deploy it? Would you, of course, you would give it to patients that are sick, but would you also give it prophylactic to health workers? You, you're asking. You're asking me in particular again. M mine is not the expertise in policy and, and, and drug uh, distribution, etc. I'll answer you as an individual, not as an expert. Uh, it looks to me we are going to have a limited but then gradually escalating supply of ZMAP and perhaps of other drugs that are going to be effective that haven't been proven yet. It, the, the, this whole issue that we just heard here that the doctors, the, in, the health infrastructure is being hit the hardest. And uh, if more women are dying in childbirth than are people dying from Ebola, it says we need to deal with the healthcare delivery system as a first priority. And I think in a very practical sense, we're gonna have to deal with providing drug to the volunteers, the Western volunteers who come in to help to maintain the supply of people willing to take the risk to go in there. W mm -hmm. Would you agree? Yeah, uh, that, that's the Doctors Without Borders MSF standpoint as well. That if you need to prioritize, and you probably will have to prioritize, you have to uh, prioritize the people on the front line, meaning the healthcare workers and, and, and also the people taking care of the, the dead body management, people who are really yeah. in close contact with the virus first, so that they can continue to provide that, that care to isolate the virus and to keep it out of the, the community, yes. Um, then I would like uh, Jon Arne to make a final comment, please. Um, yeah, no, I... Um, the markets have not solved this problem in 40 years. We need kind of societal responses and I would like to object then to the, the lack of trust in governments because the only, only way we can solve issues like this collectively is through governments and through co collaboration among governments. Otherwise, it would have happened if the market would have fixed it. And I think we need that sort of collective response. Tonight, just as we have been sitting here, there has been another launch or that's been two kilometers down the road. And that's of the, this current government's new long-term strategy for research and development. We need governments with foresight and willingness to invest in the needs that will arise. Because we all, if we only have governments and politicians that react to emergencies, we will not be able to handle them. That's linked to the climate change. I'm glad we have a chair of the biotechnology uh, board who is both a former politician and, and concerned about another very important public issue. And we need politicians with foresight and willingness to invest. And that's governments. Thank you very much. Uh, then I would like to to close this session and thank you for coming here and thank you for contributing, contrib your contribution for interest in this important topic. Thank you very much, Professor Charles Arnsen. Thank you, Fria Aftab. Thank you, Jon Arne Röttingen. And thank you, Lindis Hurum, for making this such an interesting evening. On behalf of the rector of the university and the Biotechnology Advisory Board, we also would like to thank our collaborators. That is Realfagsbiblioteket, Realistforeningen, and OUAEM. Tusen takk for at dere kom and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you.